So I'm wearing a, um, a pink tie for throwback day. And uh, coming out of high school, I had an uncle who set me up for a job interview um, with Xerox. And I didn't understand the concept of a, a white collar job. I went into the job interview, long hair, hot pink shirt, hot pink collared shirt. I, I figured I would wear the best shirt that I had, and I forget what the tie was, but so I had this hot pink shirt on. I did not get the job. The feedback came back through my uncle who said, you know that was a white collar job you were applying for. And I was like, white collar? That's, that was like literal? I should have worn a white shirt. And he was like, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've got my pink tie on. Um, I asked Mrs. Ribera whether this matched. And she was like, it, I don't think it matters whether it matches or not. But when I showed her this, yeah, baby. <laughs> I showed her this. <laughs> she was like, you've got it. You've, you've got the whole thing. And it's, that's great. <clears throat> I don't have the pink shirt anymore. So we've been talking this year about uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the theme, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And I thought the best way for me to encourage you to fix your eyes on Jesus would be to communicate with you the gospel of Jesus. Because if we, if we understand the gospel and we get it into our hearts, then we'll be able to fix our eyes on Jesus because that's why Jesus came. And so my plan today is to tell you two stories. <clears throat> I have the story of the two lost sons, more commonly known as the prodigal son. And then I'm going to read, a, um, I'm going to read one of my favorite children's books to you. And uh, the book was written by Phil Vischer, the creator of VeggieTales. And it's called um, Sydney and Norman, A Tale of Two Pigs. So let me, let, let me pray, and then um, I'll read scripture, and then we'll talk some more. Father, thank you so much that we can come together as a community. Lord, thank you that you give us creativity and imagination, and you give us joy together. You allow us to celebrate as a community. Lord, please speak to our hearts today. Um, help us to find ourselves in these stories and help us to understand who you are so that we can fix our eyes on you, our Savior. Um, after I tell you these two stories, I'm going to spend a few minutes at the end comparing and contrasting the two stories. And then hopefully you'll find yourself in, in one or more of the characters. So let's, let's talk about the, the parable of the prodigal son. Let me read it to you. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, he squandered but he, he gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise, I will go to my father, I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired servants. And so he arose, he came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him, and he kissed him and said to his son, Father, he, the son said to the father, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it, let's eat, let's celebrate. For the son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older brother was in the field. And as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called to one of the servants and he asked, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf. And because, because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older brother was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered, Father, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this, this son of yours comes who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now you may be familiar with that parable. This parable is a story in two acts. In act one, the younger son is featured. Well, in act two, the older son is featured. <clears throat> in act one, the younger son asks for his part of the inheritance. This is equivalent to the son saying to his father, I wish you were dead because I want my inheritance right now. He wanted to speed up the day of his inheritance. The father though disrespected and dishonored publicly, he complies with the young man's wishes and he gives him his inheritance. Soon he leaves home, he squanders his fortune in an unrestrained party lifestyle. He ends up desperate, starving, and feeding pigs. He's come to ruin and he finally comes to his senses. He knows he deserves nothing but in desperation and humility, he makes a plan to return to his father. He's going to ask to become a hired servant. His father now, seeing his son from a long distance, throws aside his dignity. He runs to welcome his son. As the son begins his, his rehearsed apology, the father will hear nothing of the son's plan. He receives him back with an extravagant love and grace, and he restores the son to his family. The lost son is now found. He gets the best robe, which was probably the father's own robe, and in a rare moment of celebration, the fattened calf, which is set aside for special occasions, is slaughtered, and a grand feast ensues. The father who had been dishonored publicly now in public view has restored his lost son and he celebrates his homecoming. Act two, the elder son hears the celebration, he enters the scene and now he dishonors the father by not going into the feast. This would have been a public feast. It would have been a community celebration. He dishonors his father, and we learn that even though this older son is a rule follower, he's a dependable son, he is angry and indignant that his father would welcome this younger son back who had disgraced the family. And also, the welcoming the younger son back now decreases his share of the remaining estate. It turns out his life of service was for himself. It wasn't out of love for the father. The older son is full of pride. He's self-righteous and he's judgmental. 
Now, you may recall that Jesus is speaking to a crowd with two groups of people. There were those who were called the tax collectors and the sinners whom Jesus was eating with, and there were the Pharisees and the teachers who were standing there muttering, this man eats with sinners, and he welcomes them. Bah! So this story that Jesus told is for both groups, the tax collectors and sinners, and even more for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. We often call this parable the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal means someone who spends recklessly, spends freely, someone who's wastefully extra extravagant. Now that description works for the younger son because when he received his portion of the inheritance, he goes out and he spends it on, on um, a lavish lifestyle of partying. But you know, um, we could call this story by a, a name different from the prodigal son. I really like calling it the story of the two lost sons because remember the story has two acts. Act one, the younger son who runs away and comes back, then the older son who remains distant. The story encourages us to know that God will welcome us back. Um, a third title for the story is the story of the prodigal father, or I'm calling it the story of the prodigal God. Because in the end, it is the father who freely gives the son his share of the inheritance. It's the father who showers him with blessings, the robe, the ring, the shoes, the feast. And finally, it's this prodigal, this giving father who entreats the older brother to come in and join the celebration. In the parable of the two lost sons, both sons were lost in their own way. The father graciously goes out, he pursues both sons, the younger son felt his need and experiences his father's love. The older son, though, thought that the father owed him, and in the end, he remains outside. I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to read um, this book to you. So bear with me. Um, <clears throat> the last time I read this book publicly, I was in Mrs. Ribera's first grade class. But you know what? I think you're going to enjoy it. So everybody loves children's books. <clears throat> On a quiet street in a quiet town lived two pigs. They didn't oink or eat slop. No, this isn't that kind of story. They wore suits and they went to work. And even though they lived right next door to each other, they didn't know each other's name. The pig on the right was Norman. He was a very good pig. Rules and hard work had always come easily to him, and it showed. His house was neat and organized. He always looked his best. He gave money to the needy, and he never missed church on Sunday. Norman's teachers liked him when he was young, and his boss at work liked him now that he was grown up. He was pretty sure that God liked him too. After all, he was a very good pig. Norman figured that everyone, everyone could be as good as he was if they'd only try a little harder. And he wondered, why didn't they try? The pig on the left was Sydney. Things didn't come quite as easily for Sydney. Rules and systems and schedules seemed, well, a bit slippery. One minute he thought he had them, the next minute, whoops, where did they go? He was forever running 10 minutes late. He could never manage, no matter how hard he tried, to get his tie perfectly straight, not like his neighbor. What, what was his name? Sidney got in trouble in school, which frustrated his teachers. He got in trouble at work, which frustrated his boss. He knew God was watching, and he was pretty sure that God was frustrated too. But most of all, Sidney frustrated Sidney. 
Why was everything so hard? Why couldn't he be more like, oh, what was his name? Sidney felt broken. And some days that made it hard to get up in the morning. Some days, in fact, Sidney couldn't get up at all. Since Sidney was usually late and Norman was usually early, they very seldomly saw each other, unless it is they happened to fetch their mail at the same time, which is exactly what happened one bright morning in October. Now, normally, if Sidney saw Norman, he would look down <clears throat> and shuffle back inside. He was sure that Norman was staring at his tie or his hair or the papers half stuck into his briefcase. He was sure Norman was looking down on him for being messy, which for the most part was absolutely correct. But this day, Norman didn't look at Sidney's tie and Sidney didn't look away because they were both staring at small pale blue envelopes that they had received in the mail. One was addressed to Norman and the other was addressed to Sydney. Hmm, someone, had someone invited them both to the same party? Eager, they unravel, eager to unravel the mystery, the two pigs opened the envelopes. Norman read, Dear Norman, and Sydney read, Dear Sydney, followed by, I would like you to come to visit me at 77 Elm Street next Tuesday at your convenience. I have something to tell you. They both glanced at the bottom of the page and it read, Sincerely, God. Sidney and Norman reread the invitations several times to make sure they had read them correctly. God wanted to talk to them on Tuesday? On Elm Street? Sidney panicked. Deep in his heart was a familiar feeling, the feeling he had when as a young pig, his teachers had sent him to the principal's office. Terror, panic, doom. Norman smiled. He too felt a familiar feeling. The feeling he had when, as a young pig, he was called up front to the, of the school to receive an award. Anticipation, happiness, pride. Sidney taped the invitation to the inside of his front door so he wouldn't lose it. Norman entered the date neatly in his date book. Both pigs had trouble sleeping that night for very different reasons. Tuesday came. Norman awoke early, dressed, and headed down the street with the pale blue envelope firmly in his hand. Just waking up, Sidney saw him pass by the window, and he rushed into the shower. Norman walked tall and proud. Others on the street noticed that he walked a bit taller and more than a little puffier than usual that morning. His hair was neat, his tie was extraordinarily straight, much straighter than anyone else's on the street. God would certainly be pleased. Norman found the address, went inside, greeting the woman at the front desk with his important voice. He direct, she directed him down a long hall, through a heavy wooden door, into a large room where he found God sitting behind an immense desk. The sight made Norman nervous, but then he thought, what did he have to be nervous about? He was a good pig. God walked around his desk, smiled at the puffed up pig. I'm glad you could make it he said warmly. I have a few things to tell you. First of all, God began, I love you. Norman smiled, though he 
he wasn't surprised. Secondly, your goodness is not the reason that I love you. Norman startled a little. What a curious thing for God to say. Thirdly, God continued, you are not as good as you have led yourself to believe. You're prideful. You're selfish. You look down on others simply because things don't come as easily for them. God looked a little sad now. I love them as much as I love you. Don't look down on those that I love. Then God smiled and he returned to his desk. That is what I needed to tell you. Norman swallowed hard. That was awkward. That was the commendation? That was the award? Confused, he turned and he ran down the hall, past the front desk, back out onto the street. His head was spinning. He felt dizzy. Was God finding fault with him? He was a good pig. He noticed his tie was off kilter. <laughs> he hurried to straighten it. Not perfect, but at least better than that fellow over there in the yellow jacket or the guy in the blue or any of these people for that matter. My then it hit him. He was looking down on those people right then, right there. Just like God had said. And he had done it yesterday and the day before, 20 times a day at least. Norman's face grew hot. God was right. He was selfish. He was prideful. For the first time in his life, the good pig had to face the fact that he had been very, very bad. His pride and his goodness was his sin. He buried his face in his hands in public. He hurried home, tears splashing on his neat gray suit. From his window, Sidney saw his neighbor return, and he froze in shock. Was he crying? Sidney couldn't breathe. Oh dear, oh dear. If that's what a visit with God did to that guy, I'm doomed. Hands shaking, Sidney tried once more to get his tie just right. Why was this so hard? Where was his hat? Oh, not on the hook, of course. Under the couch. <laughs> hat in hand, he peeled the blue, the blue envelope off the door. He stepped outside. <clears throat> A bird was singing that morning. But Sidney didn't hear it. The sun was shining brightly. But Sidney didn't see it. Doomed, doomed, he thought. Sidney struggled, trudged down the sidewalk. Suddenly, back in school, a little pig headed down the long hallway toward the principal's office, hands sweating, heart racing. I'm doomed, doomed. He'll see right through me, Sidney thought as he turned onto Elm Street. My messes, my mistakes, everything. And then he was there. Though he had walked as slowly as he could, he was there. Sidney stepped inside. He tried to say something to the woman at the front desk, but he couldn't speak. She smiled at him and motioned him to the heavy wooden door down the hall. He gulped. A few minutes later, he found the door he wanted to run away, he wanted to hide, but there was no place to go, nothing to hide behind. So, hat in hand, he pushed open the door, slipped inside, and there, behind the desk, was God. Sidney gulped. I'm glad you could come, God said, smiling. Sidney tried to respond, but couldn't make any noise. 
I want to tell you something, God continued as he came around the desk. Sidney glanced around nervously. Maybe if I apologized. First of all, God began, I love you. Sidney startled, surprised. Secondly, God continued in a quieter voice, I love you. Sidney was gripping his hat a little less tightly now. And thirdly, God paused very close to Sidney. He said, I love you. The look in God's eyes warmed Sidney right down to his toes. That is what I wanted to tell you, God said, as he stepped back toward his desk, smiling. Sidney stood frozen for a moment, and then realizing God had finished, he turned and he ran quickly from the room. I, I don't understand, he said out loud when he reached the street. Didn't he see me? Didn't he see who I am? D it didn't, didn't make sense. Then it occurred to him, ah, I, I did it. I, I fooled him. Sidney looked at the others on the street smiling. Yes, that must be it. I looked good when it was most important. And he, and he bought it. Just then, Sidney caught his own reflection in a store window. His hair was rumpled, his tie was off kilter, as usual, sporting a large toothpaste stain. His smile vanished. He said, no, that couldn't be it. I couldn't fool anybody. No, not looking like this. I didn't fool God. Sidney was confused. There was only one other possibility, that God just loved him. Exactly like he was, messes and all. Sidney felt the warmth that he had seen in God's eyes welling up inside of him again. Others on the street would talk about the small, messy pig that they saw that day that appeared to be, well, glowing. All the way home, Sidney looked for words to tell everyone what he was feeling, but all he found were tears, happy tears, lots of them. The next day, two pigs emerged from their homes on a bright, crisp October morning and looked at each other. The pig on the left, named Sidney, who seemed to be a little bit taller than before, looked at his neighbor's neat, straight tie and clean clothes, and he smiled at him. The pig on the right, named Norman, who seemed to be ever so slightly less puffy, looked at his neighbor's crooked tie, his rumpled hair, and he smiled. It was a real smile, too. The kind that comes from deep inside. The kind that he hadn't smiled in a long, long time. Sidney and Norman became good friends. There were still mornings now when Norman would wake up feeling a little puffy, but all he had to do was to remember what he had learned at 77 Elm Street. Then the puffiness would quickly vanish and his real smile would return. As for Sidney, he still had his share of messes, though not as many as before. And there were still a few days when he wasn't quite sure he could get up in the morning. But if you stood outside his window on one of those days, this is what you would hear him say. First of all, he loves me. Secondly, he loves me. Thirdly, he loves me. <clears throat> now, a couple of comments. I realize that Sidney is not entirely like the younger son in Jesus' parable. The younger son is disrespectful to his father. He pursues a life of selfishness, wantonness, debauchery. 
Basically, he has lived an immoral life, and then he crashes and he burns. Well, Sidney is disorganized. He's a bit disheveled. He's socially awkward, generally late. But these are not sins. The similarity between Sidney and the younger brother is that both of them feel inadequate. They both feel unworthy. They are both undeserving and they both feel not very lovable. Norman is similar in some ways to the older son in Jesus' parable. They are both rule followers. They are both content with their own goodness, their own righteousness. They both feel worthy. They both feel deserving of recognition and good things. They are both focused on themselves their own accomplishments, their own records. They are critical, judgmental of others, and they feel that God and the world owe them. Perhaps you relate to Sidney or the younger brother. Maybe you've moved away from God. Maybe you're avoiding him. Maybe you say, I avoid God because he wouldn't want my type. Or maybe you say, if you only knew what I've done, you would understand why I avoid Jesus and his people. Um, I don't want their judgment. They wouldn't want me. They wouldn't approve of me. Perhaps you can relate to Norman or the older son. Maybe you cherish your GPA, your status, your accomplishments. Maybe you look great and you hang out with all the right people. Maybe God and the world owe you. But do you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? Or do you look down on others? Sydney, are you more like Sydney? Are you more like Norman? Do you feel more like the younger brother or the older brother? The huge difference between Norman and the older son is where they each end up in the story. The good news for Norman in the tale of the two pigs is that he accepts God's love and it changes him. The sad news for the older son is that when the story ends, he is still outside the feast and he does not accept the father's love. If you are the younger sibling, you need to know that your father is running to welcome you. If you're like Sydney, you need to know that God loves you. If you're the older sibling, you need to know that your father is pleading with you to join the feast. You should accept his invitation. If you're like Norman, you need to stop judging Sydney. <clears throat> I would love to talk with you more about this. If you have no other plans for office hours today, I'll be in G109. I'm happy to talk with you. If you're curious, the story of the prodigal God, my understanding of that parable has really been informed by one of my favorite authors, some of you know this guy, I've talked about him. He wrote a book called The Prodigal God. I recommend that you pick it up and read it. Let's pray. Father, you are the God who runs to meet us wherever we are. You're the God who pleads for us to come in and feast with you. Lord, I pray that we would accept your invitation. I pray that we would understand and, and respond to your love. Thank you so much for coming, for giving of yourself, for loving us. Lord, whether we are younger or older, Sydney or Norman, Lord, we know that we can be part of your family and we want to accept that invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um,